Book Two, Part One of the Aeneid. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Aeneid by Publius Regilius Maro, translated by John Dryden. Book Two, How They Took the City, Part One. All were attentive to the godlike man when from his lofty couch he thus began. Great queen, what you command me to relate, renews the sad remembrance of our fate. An empire from its old foundations rent, and every woe the Trojans underwent. A peopled city made a desert place. All that I saw, and part of which I was, not even the hardest of our foes could hear, nor stern Ulysses tell without a tear. And now, the latter watch of wasting night, and setting stars to kindly rest invite. But since you take such interest in our woe, and Troy's disastrous end desire to know, I will restrain my tears and briefly tell what in our last and fatal night befell. By destiny compelled and in despair, the Greeks grew weary of the tedious war, and by Minerva's aid a fabric reared, which like a steed of monstrous height appeared. The sides were planked with pine, they feigned it made, for their return, and thus this vow they paid. Thus they pretend, but in the hollow side, selected numbers of their soldiers hide, with inward arms the dire machines they load, and iron bowels stuff the dark abode. In sight of Troy lies Tenedos, an isle, while fortune did on Priam's empire smile. Renowned for wealth, but since a faithless bay, where ships exposed to wind and weather lay, there was their fleet concealed, we thought, for Greece. Their sails were hoisted, and our fears release. The Trojans, cooped within their walls so long, unbar their gates and issue in a throng, like swarming bees, and with delight survey, the camp deserted where the Grecians lay. The quarters of the several chiefs they showed, here Phoenix, here Achilles, made abode. Here joined the battles, here the navy rode. Part on the pile their wondering eyes employ, the pile by Pallas raised to ruin Troy. Thymoetes first, tis as doubtful whether hired, or so the Trojan destiny required, moved that the ramparts might be broken down, to lodge the monster fabric in the town. But Capes and the rest of sounder mind, the fatal present to the flames designed, or to the watery deep, at least to bore the hollow sides, and hidden frauds explore. The giddy vulgar, as their fancies guide, with noise say nothing, and in parts divide. Laocoon, followed by a numerous crowd, ran from the fort and cried from afar aloud, O oh, wretched countrymen, what fury reigns! What more than madness has possessed your brains? Think you the Grecians from your coasts are gone? And are Ulysses' arts no better known? This hollow fabric either must enclose Within its blind recesses our secret foes, Or tis an engine raised above the town To overlook the walls and then to batter down. Somewhat is sure designed by fraud or force. Trust not their presence, nor admit the horse. Thus having said, against the steed he threw, his forceful spear, which, hissing as flew, pierced through the yielding planks of jointed wood, and trembling in the hollow body stood. The sides transpierced returned a rattling sound, and groans of Greeks enclosed come issuing through the wound. And, had not heaven the fall of Troy designed, or had not men been fated to be blind, Enough was said and done to inspire a better mind. Then had our lances pierced the treacherous wood, and Ilian towers and Priam's empire stood. Meantime with shouts the Trojan shepherds bring, a captive Greek in bands before the king, taken to take, who made himself their prey, to impose on their belief and Troy betray. Fixed on his arm and obstinately bent, to die undaunted, or to circumvent. About the captive, tides of Trojans flow, all press to see, and some insult the foe. Now hear how well the Greeks their wiles disguised, 
Behold a nation in a man comprised. Trembling, the miscreant stood, unarmed and bound. He starred and rolled his haggard eyes around. Then said, Alas, what earth remains, what sea, is open to receive unhappy me? What fate a wretched fugitive attends, scorned by my foes, abandoned by my friends? He said, and sighed, and cast a rueful eye, our pity kindles, and our passions die. We cheer youth to make his own defense, and freely tell us what he was and whence. What news he could impart we long to know, and what to credit from a captive foe. His fear at length dismissed, he said, whatever my fate ordains, my word shall be sincere. I neither can nor dare my birth disclaim. Greece is my country, Sinon is my name. Though plunged by fortune's power and misery, tis not in fortune's power to make me lie. If any chance has hither brought me the name of Palamedes, not unknown to fame, who suffered from the malice of the times, accused and sentenced for pretended crimes. Because these fatal wars he would prevent, whose death the wretched Greeks too late lament, me then a boy, my father poor and bare, of other means committed to his care his kinsman and companion in the war. While fortune favored, while his arms support, the cause and ruled the counsels of the court, I made some figure there, nor was my name, obscure, nor I without my share of fame. But when Ulysses, with fallacious arts, had made impression in the people's hearts, and forged a treason in my patron's name, I speak of things too far divulged by fame. My kinsman fell, then I, without support, in private mourned his loss, and left the court. Mad as I was, I could not bear his fate, with silent grief, but loudly blamed the state, and cursed the direful author of my woes. T'was told again, and hence my ruin rose. I threatened, if indulgent heaven once more would land me safely on my native shore, his death with double vengeance to restore. This moved the murderer's hate, and thus ensued the effects of malice from a man so proud. Ambiguous rumors through the camp he spread, insult by treason, my devoted head. New crimes invented, left unturned no stone, to make my guilt appear and hide his own, till Calchas was by force and threatening wrought. But why, why dwell I on that anxious thought? If on my nation just revenge you seek, and it is to appear a foe, to appear a Greek. Already you, my name and country, know. Assuage your thirst of blood, and strike the blow. My death will both the kingly brothers please, and set insatious Ithacus at ease. This fair, unfinished tale, these broken starts, raised expectations in our longing hearts. Unknowing as we were in Grecian arts, his former trembling once again renewed, with acted fear the villain thus pursued. Long had the Grecians, tired with fruitless care, and wearied with an unsuccessful war, resolved to raise the siege and leave the town, and had the gods permitted they had gone, but oft the wintry seas and southern winds withstood their passage home and changed their minds. Portents and prodigies their souls amazed, but most when this stupendous pile was raised. Then flaming meteors hung in air were seen, and thunders rattled through a sky serene. Dismayed and fearful of some dire event, Eurypylus to inquire their fate was sent. He from the gods this dreadful answer brought. O Grecians, when the Trojan shores you sought, your passage with a virgin's blood was bought. So must your safe return be bought again, and Grecian blood once more to atone the main. The spreading rumor round the people ran, all feared and each believed himself the man. Ulysses took the advantage of their fright, called Calchas and produced an open sight. Then bade him name the wretch ordained by fate, the public victim, to redeem the state. Already some presaged the dire event and saw what sacrifice Ulysses meant. For twice five days the old seer withstood the intended treason and was dumb to blood till, tired with endless clamors and pursuit, 
Of Ithacus he stood no longer mute, but, as it was agreed, pronounced that I was destined by the wrathful gods to die. All praise the sentence, please the storm should fall, on one alone whose fury threatened all. The dismal day was come, the priests prepare their leavened cakes and fillets for my hair. I followed nature's laws, and must avow, I broke my bonds and fled the fatal blow. Hid in a weedy lake all night I lay, secure of safety when they sailed away. But now what further hopes for me remain, to see my friends or native soil again? My tender infants, or my careful sire, whom they returning will to death require, will perpetrate on them their first design, and take the forfeit of their heads for mine. Which I, if pity mortal minds could move, if there be faith below or gods above, if innocence and truth can claim desert, ye Trojans from an injured wretch avert. False tears true pity move, the king commands to loose his fetters and unbind his hands. Then adds these friendly words, Dismiss thy fears, forget the Greeks, be mine as thou wert theirs. But truly tell, was it for force or guile, or some religious end you raised the pile? Thus said the king, he, full of fraudful arts, this well-invented tale for truth imparts. Ye lamps of heaven, he said, and lifted high, his hands now free, thou venerable sky, inviolable powers adorned with dread, ye fatal fillets that once bound this head, ye sacred altars from whose flames I fled, be of all adjured and grant I may, without a crime the ungrateful Greeks betray. Reveal the secrets of the guilty state, and justly punish whom I hate. But you, O king, preserve the faith you gave, if I, to save myself, your empire save. The Grecian hopes, and all the attempts they made, were only founded on Minerva's aid. But from the time when impious Diomedes and false Ulysses, that inventive head, her fatal image from the temple drew, the sleeping guardians of the castle slew, her virgin statue with the bloody hands, polluted and profaned her holy bands. From thence the tide of fortune left their shore, and ebbed much faster than it flowed before. Their courage languished as their hopes decayed, and Pallas, now adverse, refused her aid. Nor did the goddess doubtfully declare her altered mind and alienated care. When first her fatal image touched the ground, she sternly cast her glaring eyes around, that sparkled as they rolled and seemed to threat, her heavenly limbs distilled a briny sweat. Thrice from the ground she leapt and was seen to wield her brandished lance and shake her horrid shield. Then Calchas bade our host for flight and hope no conquest from the tedious war. Till first they sailed for Greece, their prayers besought, her injured power and better omens brought. And now their navies plows the watery main, yet soon expect it on your shores again, with Pallas pleased, as Calchas did ordain, but first to reconcile the blue-eyed maid, for her stolen statue and her tower betrayed. Warned by the steer to her offended name, we raised and dedicated this wondrous frame, so lofty, lest through your forbidden gates it passed and intercept our better fates. For once admitted there, our hopes are lost, and Troy may then a new palladium boast. For so religion and gods ordain, that, if you violate with hands profane, Minerva's gift, your town in flame shall burn, which omen, O ye gods, on Grecia turn. But, if it climb with your assisting hands, the Trojan walls, and in the city stands, then Troy shall Argos and Mycenae burn, and the reverse of fate on us return. With such deceits he gained their easy hearts, too prone to credit his perfidious arts, what Diomede, nor Thetis' greater son, a thousand ships, nor ten years' siege, had done. False tears and fawning words, the city won. A greater omen, and of worse portent, did our unwary minds with fear torment, concurring to produce the dire event. Laocoon, Neptune's priest by lot that year, with solemn pomp, then sacrificed a steer. When, dreadful to behold, from the sea we spied, two serpents, rank abreast the seas divide, 
and smoothly seep along the swelling tide. Their flaming crests above the waves they show, their bellies seem to burn the seas below, their speckled tails advance to steer their course, and on the sounding shore the flying billows force. And now the strand, and now the plain they held, their ardent eyes with bloody streaks were filled, their nimble tongues they brandished as they came, and licked their hissing jaws that spluttered flame. We fled amazed, their destined way to take, and to Laocoon and to his children make. At first round the tender boys they wind, then with their sharpened fangs their limbs and bodies grind. The wretched father running to their aid, with pious haste but vain, they next invade, twice round his waist their winding volumes rolled, and twice about his grasping throat they fold. The priest, thus doubly choked, their crests divide, and towering over his head in triumph ride. With both his hands he labors at the knots, his holy fillets the blue venom blots, his roaring fills the flitting air around. Thus, when an ox receives a glancing wound, he breaks his bands, the fatal altar flies, and with loud bellowing breaks the yielding skies. Their tasks performed, the serpents quit their prey, and to the tower palace make their way. Couched at her feet, they lie protected there, by her large buckler and pretended spear. Amazement seizes all, the general cry, proclaims Laocoon justly doomed to die, whose hand the will of Pallas had withstood, and dared to violate the sacred wood. All vote to admit the steed, that vows be paid, and incense offered to the offended maid. A spacious breach is made, the town lies bare, some hoisting levers, some the wheels prepare, and fasten to the horse's feet the rest, with cables haul along the unwieldy beast. Each on his own fellow for assistance calls, at length the fatal fabric mounts the walls. Big with destruction, boys with chaplets crowned, and choirs of virgins sing and dance around. Thus raised aloft, and then descending down, it enters over our heads, and threats the town. O sacred city, built by hands divine, O valiant heroes of the Trojan line! Four times he struck, as oft the clashing sound, Of arms were heard, and inward groans rebound. Yet, mad with zeal, and blinded with our fate, We haul along the horse in solemn state. Then placed the dire portent within the tower, Cassandra cried and cursed the unhappy hour, foretold our fate, but by the gods' decree, all heard, but none believed the prophecy. With branches we the fanes adorn and waste, in joliality the day ordained to be the last. Meantime, the rapid heavens rolled down the light, and on the shaded ocean rushed the night. Our men, secure, nor guards nor sentries held, but easy sleep their weary limbs compelled. The Grecians had embarked their naval powers from Tenedos and sought our well-known shores. Safe under covert of the silent night and guided by the imperial galley's light, when Sinon, favored by the partial gods, unlocked the horse and opt his dark abodes, restored to the vital air our hidden foes, who, joyful from their long confinement rose, Tysander bold, and Sthenelus their guide, and dire Ulysses down the cable slide. Then Thoas, Athemus, and Pyrrhus haste. Nor was the Podolarian hero last, nor injured Menelaus, nor the famed Epius, who the fatal engine framed. A nameless crowd succeed, their forces joined, to invade the town, oppressed with sleep and wine. Those few they find awake first meet their fate, then to their fellows they unbar their gate. T'was in the dead of the night, when sleep repairs, our bodies worn with toils, our minds with cares, when Hector's ghost before my sight appears, a bloody shroud he seemed, and bathed in tears. Such as he was when, by Pelides slain, Thessalian corsairs dragged him over the plain, swollen were his feet, as when the throngs were thrust, through the board holes, his body black with dust. Unlike that Hector, who returned from toils, of war triumphant in Achaean spoils, or him who made the fainting Greeks retire, 
and launched from their navy Phrygian fire. His hair and beard stood stiffened with his gore. All the wounds he for his country bore, now streamed afresh, and with new purple ran. I wept to see the visionary man, and while my trance continued, thus began. O oh, light of Trojans and support of Troy, thy father's champion and thy country's joy, O oh, long expected by thy friends, from whence art thou so late returned for our defense? Do we behold thee, wearied as we are, with length of labors and with toils of war? After so many funerals of our own, art thou restored to thy declining town? But say, what wounds are these? What new disgrace deforms the manly features of thy face? To this the spectre no reply did frame, but answered to the cause for which he came. And groaning from the bottom of his breast, this warning in these mournful words expressed, O oh, goddess born, escape by timely flight, the flames and horrors of this fatal night, the foes already have possessed the wall, Troy nods from high and totters to her fall. Enough is paid to Priam's royal name, more than enough to duty and to fame. If by a mortal hand my father's throne could be defended, t'was by mine alone. Now Troy to thee commends her future state, and gives her gods companions of thy fate. From their assistance walls expect, which wandering long at last thou shalt erect. He said, and brought to me, from their blessed abodes, the venerable statues of the gods, with ancient Vesta from the sacred choir, the wreaths and relics of the immortal fire. Now peals of shouts came thundering from afar, cries, threats, and loud laments, and mingled war. The noise approaches, though our palace stood, aloof from streets, encompassed with a wood. Louder, and yet more loud, I hear the alarms, of human cries distinct in clashing arms. Fear broke my slumbers, I no longer stay, but mount the terrace, thence the town survey, and hearken what the frightful sounds convey. Thus, when a flood of fire by wind is borne, crackling it rolls and mows the standing corn, or deluges descending on the plains, sweeping over the yellow year, destroying the pains of laboring oxen and peasants' gains, Unroot the forest oaks and bear away, Flocks, folds, and trees, and undistinguished prey. The shepherd climbs the cliff and sees from afar The wasteful ravaging of the watery war. Then Hector's faith was manifestly cleared, And the Grecian frauds in open light appeared. The palace of Dave Phobus ascends In smoky flames and catches on his friends. Ucalagon burns next, the seas are bright, With splendor not their own, and shine with Trojan light. New clamors and new clangors now arise, the sound of trumpets mixed with fighting cries. With frenzy seized, I run to meet the alarms, resolved on death, resolved to die in arms. But first to gather friends, and with them to oppose, if fortune favored, and repel the foes, spurred by my courage, and by my country fired, with sense of honor, and revenge inspired. Pantheus, Apollo's priest, a sacred name, had scaped the Grecian swords and passed the flame. With relics loaded, to my doors he fled, and by the hand of his tender grandson led. What hope, O Pantheus, whither can we run? Where make a stand, and what yet may be done? Scarce said I, when Pantheus with a groan, Troy is no more, and Ilium was a town. The fatal day, the appointed hour is come when wrathful Jove's irrevocable doom transfers the Trojan state to Grecian hands. The fire consumes the town, the foe commands. And arm hosts, an unexpected force, break from the bows of the fatal horse. Within the gates, proud Sinon throws about, the flames and foes for entrance press without. With thousand others, whom I fear to name, more than from Argos or Mycenae came, to several posts their parties they divide, some block the narrow streets, some scour the wide. The bold they kill, the unwary they surprise. Who fights finds death, and death finds him who flies. The warders of the gate but scarce maintain the unequal combat and resist in vain. I heard, 
and heaven that well-born soul inspires, prompts me through lifted swords and rising fires, to run where clashing arms and clamor calls, and rush undaunted to defend the walls. Riphius and Iphitus by my side engage, for valor one renowned, and one for age. Dimus and Hypanus by moonlight knew, my motions in my mien, and to my party drew. With young Coribus, who by love was led, to win renowned, and fair Cassandra's bed, and lately brought his troops to Priam's aid, forewarned in vain by the prophetic maid, whom when I saw resolved in arms to fall, and that one spirit animated all. Brave souls, said I, but brave alas in vain, come finish what our cruel fates ordain. You see the desperate state of our affairs, and heaven's protecting powers are deaf to prayers. The passive gods behold the Greeks defile, their temples and abandon to the spoil. Their own abodes, we, feeble few, conspire, to save a sinking town involved in fire. Then let us fall, but fall amidst our foes. Despair of life, the means of living shows. So bold a speech encouraged their desire, of death and added fuel to their fire. As hungry wolves, with raging appetite, scour through the fields, nor fear the stormy night. Their whelps at home expect the promised food, and long to temper their dry chaps in blood. So rushed we forth at once, resolved to die, resolved in death the last extremes to try. We leave the narrow lanes behind, and dare the unequal combat in the public square. Night was our friend, our leader was despair. What tongue can tell the slaughter of that night? What eyes can weep the sorrows and affright? An ancient and imperial city falls. The streets are filled with frequent funerals. Houses and holy temples float in blood, and hostile nations make a common flood. Not only Trojans fall, but in their turn, the vanquished triumph and the victors mourn. Ours take courage from despair and night. Confused the fortune is, confused the fight. All parts resound with tumults, plaints, and fears, and grisly death in sundry shapes appears. Androgeos fell among us with his band, who thought us Grecians newly come to land. From whence, said he, my friends, this long delay? You loiter while the spoils are borne away. Our ships are laden with the Trojan store, and you, like truants, come too late ashore. He said, but soon corrected his mistake found by the doubtful answers which we make. Amazed he would have shunned the unequal fight, but we, more numerous, intercepted his flight. As when some peasant in a bushy brake has with unwary footing pressed a snake, he starts aside, astonished when he spies his rising crest, blue neck, and rolling eyes. So from our arms, surprised, Androgeos flies. In vain, for him and his we compassed round, possessed with fear, unknowing of the ground, and of their lives an easy conquest found. Thus fortune on our first endeavor smiled. Coribus then, with youthful hopes beguiled, swollen with success and a daring mind, this new invention fatally designed. My friend, said he, since fortune shows the way, tis fit that we should the auspicious guide obey. For what has she, these Grecian arms bestowed, but their destruction and the Trojans' good? Then change we shields and their devices bear. Let fraud supply the want of force in war. They find us arms, this said, himself he dressed, in dead Androgeus' spoils, his upper vest, his painted buckler, and his plumy crest. Thus Riphius, Dimus, all the Trojan train, lay down their own attire and strip the slain. Mixed with the Greeks we go with ill presage, flattered with hopes to glut our greedy rage. Unknown, assaulting whom we blindly met, and strew with Grecian carcasses the street. Thus, while their straggling parties we defeat, some to the shore and safer ships retreat, and some, oppressed with more ignoble fear, remount the hollow horse and pant in secret there. But ah, what use of valor can be made when heaven's propitious powers refuse their aid? Behold the royal prophetess, the fair, Cassandra dragged by her disheveled hair, whom not Minerva's shrine nor sacred bands in safety could protect from sacrilegious hands. On heaven she cast her eyes, 
she sighed, she cried. "'Twas all she could, her tender arms were tied. So sad a sight, Corvus could not bear, But fired with rage, distracted with despair. Amid the barbarous ravagers he flew, Our leader's rash example we pursue. But storms of stones from the proud temple's height Pour down, and on our battered helms alight. We from our friends received this fatal blow, Who thought us Grecians as we seemed in show. They aim at the mistaken crests from high, And ours beneath the ponderous ruins lie. Then, moved with anger and disdain to see, Their troops dispersed, the royal virgins free. The Grecians rally, and their powers unite, With fury charge us and renew the fight. The brother kings with Ajax join their force, And the whole squadron of Thessalian horse. End of Book Two, Part One